Hello, I'm John Grom, and welcome to our 182nd Right and Left Discussion Forum. We hold our televised discussions twice monthly to demonstrate the value of civil, productive, open-minded political dialogue. Today, our panel will discuss the rising crime rate in the United States. What is its cause? Who is responsible? And what can be done about it? Today's panel includes Patty Haskins, member of the Wadsworth City Council, Brian Laubaugh, president of r and Financial Services, and Dr. Ronald Chamberlain, retired senior research chemist. Patty, crime rates tend to rise and fall over time, but our current crime statistics are at unprecedented levels. Can you explain? Oh, I, I would love to be able to put this down to a short uh, two sentence answer, but I think that there are so many different uh, reasons why the crime rate has gone up and so many infinite different ways and disagreement actually on how to uh, diffuse the situation that occurs. I, I just heard interestingly enough this morning that since January in the city of Chicago, 212 children under the age of 17 have been shot, uh, 26 of whom have died, which is obviously a frightening uh, statistic, especially since much of this has been attributed to gang warfare and fighting that occurs in Chicago. And it's affecting the most vulnerable in, in our society, that is the children. Um, I think various organizations and various uh, groups have decided upon ways in which to try to fight the increase in crime because I don't think that you can deny the fact that the crime rate is uh, going at, you know, increasingly higher. Uh, President Biden recently uh, produced a, 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 an ordinance in which, uh, or a statement actually, in which he was his methods or reasons to fight crime and to help the situation. Um, and I think before I even go through those, I think it's important to say that there are many, many different ideas and ways in which we can deal with the crime situation as it, as it, as it occurs. And I don't think that we should just pick and choose and say, well, we'll try this one, but we're not going to try that one because it doesn't meet our political needs. I, I think we have to address all of these and see, because it's going to take, a, I, I think, a multi-pronged approach in order to deal with. Uh, the first thing that Biden has suggested is that we deal with rogue dealers uh, for gun sales and that they be held accountable. Um, I, I think along with this, you have to look at the gun situation and that much of the crime, and for example, that the one I gave of, of in Chicago, these are shootings with guns. And the more that we can remove those guns from the hands of criminals, uh, the better the situation will be. And I know that Chicago has very strong gun laws, but Chicago is just this little speck in an ocean uh, where all of the areas around it it is easy to obtain, obtain guns, easy to obtain guns illegally. And one of the ways in which Biden feels that we can deal with is to get to dealers that are selling guns illegally. A second thing that he stated was to support local police forces with resources. You know, this is the opposite of the defund the police. Um, I, I know that there are major cities across the country that have had at one time defunded and they felt this was a way to stop police violence that was occurring in the cities. I, I think this was a misguided approach. Well, I think that police reform is an absolute necessity and we do have to look into those situations. I'm a strong believer in that defunding the police force was not the choice. And many of these major cities have now taken steps to reapply funds. As President Biden has always said, he has never been a, a promoter of defunding the police so that we have enough police on the, on the streets and that they have the proper equipment. Now, this doesn't mean arming them with tanks and military grade 
uh, weapons, but having the number of people and the appropriate body armor, uh, all of the services that are needed. Third thing that he mentions was dealing with community violence intervention and to have social programs that are set up to deal with community violence, to provide alternatives to those that are involved in violence. A fourth is to expand opportunities for young adults. Many young adults, especially in inner cities, are trapped in situations where becoming a gang member is not even a choice of theirs. They are forced into that lifestyle and then that gang violence is perpetuated, leading to situations such as you have in Chicago. And the fifth thing that he mentioned was to help former convicts re-enter communities. As convicts are released from their sentence or released from jail, there has to be something that is done uh, to combat the recidivism. I can never say that word. Um, recidivism. Thank you. The repeat of, of uh, crimes that are committed. And there needs to be better uh, communication and dealing with, with former prisoners so that they can re-enter society because if they cannot re-enter society, get a workable job, find proper housing, they may resort to crime again. Um, I, I was listening to a program a, a couple weeks ago and uh, a conservative uh, guest was stating that the best way to uh, combat crime is to have more arrests, put more people in jail. And that was the only thing they offered. Now, perhaps we do need to have some changes in some of the uh, sentencing requirements and so forth that are provided for criminals. Just throwing people in jail, I do not think uh, solves the problem. Supposedly, this is a deterrent. But, um, you know, that's like saying, in my mind, it's like saying that the death penalty is a deterrent to committing murder. It's never been proven that it's such. I, I do think one of the other things that needs to be done is to have um, bail reform of the bail reform. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is certain cities such as uh, New York has uh, provided that criminals are that are arrested, and I shouldn't call them criminals, I should say those that have been indicted or arraigned or brought before crime, instead of posting bail, um, they're just simply released. And they're finding that many of these uh, people are then just, they commit another crime because they figure I'm not going to spend any, uh, any time in jail. Now, along with that though, I think there does need to be bail reform because presently the way bail is set if you are wealthy, then you can post the bail and get right back out, which gives you the opportunity to commit another crime. If you are not wealthy, uh, which tends to be more of the case here, and this is where they were addressing the situation, if you're not wealthy, then you're forced to sit in jail. I, I what, about, what, about, what about the no bail movement? Well, that's what I'm talking about, is that no bail movement. What's but The no bail movement means I don't think it means no bail that everybody stays in jail. The no bail movement was one that it said- means everybody gonna, gets out. Everybody gets out at certain levels. Now certain, and when that was placed into effect, um, if you were uh, brought in on charges of murder, you weren't given no bail. You weren't just released. Um, again, the attempt was to make equity for everyone coming before the court that just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you get to you know, go home, but if you're not wealthy, you have to stay in jail. Um, and I agree, that's a problem. But to simply just release everyone does not create a good situation as well. So I really do think that that needs to be revisited. Uh, I know that was tried big time in New York City. I don't think that that's been a successful program. Um, you know, unfortunately, crime does tend to exist at a higher degree in our inner city, in our inner cities, in our poorer neighborhoods, uh, where the citizens in those neighborhoods feel that they don't have a chance to get out of the neighborhood, where gang violence is, is uh, very active, 
but don't you think they don't you think the game the um, gang violence is driven by drugs um yes and no i don't think that it's driven by drugs in as much as many gangs uh sell drugs in order to make money to promote the gang it is not necessarily the case that those gang members are using drugs no, but I mean they're getting they're getting into to, uh, conflicts over drug trades, and we've got a huge increase in drug trafficking in the United States uh, because of the increase in border traffic, uh, bring, uh, people coming across the uh, our southern border and bringing drugs with them at a higher I, and higher level. I haven't seen a connection. I know that's the claim that there's all a lot more drugs coming into the United States. There's many ways. I think we talked once before in another program, there's more drugs coming in through Canada, through that border uh, before than that was coming through the Southern border. Uh, I, I think that that's possibly always going to be the case. I, I wouldn't jump quite to that conclusion at this point. Um, mm. I, I don't know that the drug problem is worse and is spiking the crime um, because well. of the border at this point. I think I'll that's always you. been part of the problem, though. I, I will bet you that Brian has an opinion about that. What do you think, Brian? <laughs> well, um, I agree with almost everything that Patty said. The issue that I have with the Biden administration is it seems like they talk out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party has gutted most of what Patty has been talking about. Uh, the no bail is no cash bail. Uh, the issue there is when there is no cash um, bail, the people don't show up again. Right. They don't come back. Um, and obviously it was meant, it had good intentions. Right. It was clogging up the system. There was a lot of people in jail for smaller, what we would call petty crimes. And they needed to alleviate that cost because it cost the government, it cost the city or it cost the state money to keep those people in jail for before their arraignment and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, the serious crimes, it didn't affect that, it, you know, murder, sexual crimes, it didn't affect that. So what happens is you have the person that is probably not the hardened criminal, but they're they're on the pathway to becoming a a a, a criminal. You know, they're on the pathway to doing no good. Maybe this is their second or third time. They're running. They got caught. Uh, they get out again. And, and it sets sort of a precedent for them that, hey, you know what? If I keep my burglaries under a certain dollar amount, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, they, they might catch me, but I'll go grind through the system. And after so many misdemeanors, and yeah, maybe I'll get some jail time, maybe not. Yeah. We see this with Prop 47 in California. All you have to do is get online. People are going into stores and walking away with less than $950 worth of merchandise. Right. The people, the police don't even show up. And what does what happens there is the 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 consequences, those businesses move out of those neighborhoods. Walgreens. Uh, Brian, yes. The one thing about that 950 is that what Prop 47 said was that it was not, unless it's over 950, it can't be charged as a felony. It's only charged right. as a misdemeanor. It's not right. that they can't be charged. Right, so. right. But when the police don't show up, right. to, 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 when they, you know, they go to report the crime and the police don't even show up and the people walk out, none of them are being held accountable for that bad behavior. So what happens then is, the businesses that have been in that neighborhood where people really need them, they need the Walgreens, they need the CVSs, they need the, the local stores, they move. And then what do you have? You have an urban blight, you have ghetto. And, and that's the sad part about this is, you know, certain people, as far as I'm concerned, have sown the wind, now we're reaping the whirlwind. When people can create and do crime and not even worry about any sort of punishment, that's where you see these spikes in these larger cities. You look at New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago. The criminal is not going to give up his gun. You know, this notion that somehow they have these gun buyback programs, 
um, you know, they show up, they turn in a gun, a six shooter that their grandpa had from 1942. It doesn't work. They collect a hundred dollars, but they keep the Glock that they purchased from the other guy on the, on the, on the corner for 200 bucks. You know, they keep, they keep the other things that work. So the notion that somehow we can just sort of send social workers out to these crime scenes and, and, and sort of, you know, take care of the problem. Uh, I know that there's solutions here. I'm not for throwing everybody in the jail. Uh, California did have a three strikes and you're out um, law. And I just finished a book by Malcolm Gladwell. It's an easy read. It's called David and Goliath. And he sort of tackles this issue about policing and, and, and the crime rates and all that kind of stuff. The book was written some time ago. He talks about the three strikes you're out law in California, how that came about. He also shares a real good um, example in New York in one of the highest crime areas bordering on the Bronx and in, in this one area that was just drug infested, your chances of getting mugged walking down the street. I mean, it was with 90%, you were going to get mugged, no matter if you were old person, young person, whatever. So what the police did was they put a police station in that neighborhood. They put their most capable people in there and they started tracking these young men and young women that were creating the crime. And they would go to their homes. They would tell them, listen, you can avoid jail time if you go back to school. Truancy rates were through the roof. So their idea was, you know, let's, let's stop the flow of these people, young people getting into crime by heading them off at the pass, so to speak. And they bird dogged these kids, both boys and girls, unmercifully. If their friend was involved in a burglary and their name came up, they kept, you know, databases, they went to that person's home and said, listen, your friend, Roberto, got arrested for mugging. You hang out with him. We know that. We're watching you. And it went into more of a community service and the crime rates dropped precipitously, it went down 40% in the first year because they knew the police were out on the streets. They were friends. The police, they, people knew them. They didn't pull back. They leaned into the issue. And that, I think, is the problem that I have with this defund thing. We're not Brian, leaning into the press. Brian, Brian, where was that program? It was in New York City. Ah, it was in you. New York City. And it, and it was in a borough of that surrounded the Bronx. Because what would happen is these kids would go into the Bronx, commit a crime, mm. and then go back to where they thought they were safe in their own little borough. And the police, they basically, they put a, a police station, like a mobile police station in that borough. And they increased the police presence. And it was a good presence. It wasn't like they're just jerking people off the street, but they started tracking these young men and young women. And it was amazing the results that they had. They even went out at Thanksgiving and delivered turkeys to these families of these kids. And they, wow. they developed relationships to where they would have grandparents and parents calling up and saying, my son's not home. It's one o'clock in the morning. He can't be up to any good. Yeah. Can you yeah. find him for me? And yeah. they would go out and they would find him. You know, Run. so, I think, so no. that, that's, that's what I think what we have to do. We can't defund the police. We can't run from this. I mean, we have the whole example of last summer. You know, uh, I, I just don't think we let people burn down federal buildings. We don't let them riot in the streets. We don't let them create autonomous zones because their feelings were hurt and we're afraid to hurt their feelings. You know, the law is the law. I obey the law. Ron obeys the law. Patty obey. Most of us here obey the law. And, you know, the ones that don't need to understand that their behavior has to be modified in some way. So. Ron, is that the case? You behave, uh, you be, um, obey the law? Generally. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a conscientious objector most of my life. And anyway, uh, being a scientific background, I started looking for data on this. I really wasn't terribly aware that there was an increase here. I did do notice in reading the local paper, the Akron Beacon Journal, that uh, there seemed to be an up, uptick in, in shootings and so forth. And I began to concern about that. Uh, 
plan to stay out of Akron most of, most of the time. And, uh, but not really so much of aware. So I started looking into this and uh, the question arises in my mind, is this, uh, is this homicide increase a, a significant thing? How much evidence is there for any of the explanations about what's going on? And some of the larger cities, there's up to a 25 overall uh, preliminary government reports here last year said it's about a 25% increase. But what turns out of the statistics I found that this is a rise in murders, not an increase in crime rate. Right. 25% increase in murders, 10% decrease in robberies, 8% decrease in property crimes, and 14% decrease in rapes. That's the, the overall, arrests. The are overall, you talking about uh, you... Well, yeah, but the overall <clears throat> the overall violent crime has only has been about three <clears> percent, <throat> and generally, if, this... uh, Ron, if it, in those statistics you're only talking about arrests, arrests have gone way down because police presence has gone way down. Well, yeah, that's that's another factor there, but uh, twenty five percent single year increase in homicides. But someone pointed out that this is still about half of what it was a quarter century ago. We're much less likely now to be murdered than we were in the 90s. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, some cities have, uh, this, is, this increase in, in homicides has been throughout the country in cities of all sizes. Uh, it seems to be, uh, it's being uh, driven by rising gun violence as a couple of you have mentioned. Uh, there's a nonprofit called the Gun Violence Archive reported additional 4,000 gun killings <coughs> nationwide compared to the year before. So that's not, but it's not some, some part of some broader crime wave here. So this is still, still quite serious, of course. Now, it turns out too that uh, as been alluded to, and that we're going to continue to discussing and some of this, this uh, additional violence is clustered in disenfranchised neighborhoods which uh, of color where they're already struggling with higher rates of gun violence even before the pandemic. And uh, I found a, a, a criminologist called Richard Rosenfield who has authored a number of reports on this and says, he, he quotes here, everything we know suggests that the increases in homicide are occurring in the very neighborhoods where homicide has been traditionally concentrated. What we're not seeing is the spreading of homicide. Well, what are some reasons? And uh, a lot of political rhetoric so far, uh, not much data, or real data or hard evidence. Unfortunately, in most sociological studies, it's not like some nice chemistry or physics experiment. You can't set up a control group and carry out an experiment and get a definite uh, causation here. There's, a, there's some correlations, but uh, it's really difficult to, to see a, what's going on particularly uh, in specifically. Uh, there's some different factors. There's a global pandemic and there was a there's protest movement against police violence. Uh, and it turns out uh, a study from the University of California in, in uh, uh, at Davis suggested in March to May of last year, there's a spike in gun purchases during the early months of the year. Uh, the pandemic, and it's associated with a comment on nearly six and nearly eight percent increase in gun violence from March through May, and or that would translate to about 776 additional shootings and killings in that period of time nationwide. Well, as far as the defunding police, uh, there are other kinds of prevention programs go on, uh, shutter prevention programs are called, and, and uh, for people to go out in the streets, and those have been. Those have been cut back a little bit. Uh, there have been reasons why the police have been off the streets, uh, causing problems there. But so far, uh, here's another guy, and I crime analyst, his name is Jeff Asher, and I don't know what his background is. He writes extensively about this. He examined 60 cities, and let's get this, found no correlation between the number of Black Lives Matter protests and the size of a city's homicide increase. No correlation. Okay. So attempts to link this to police problems, potential protests after George Floyd's murder, it maybe makes less sense than looking at a, at a the sweeping disruptions due to the pandemic, all the problems of the police off the streets because they're ill and uh, social mm -hmm. programs cut back because people are ill, that sort of thing. So, uh, 
So I think there's if the suspect number one of the police defunding has been the, been the uh, the pandemic. And I, I agree. And I'm I'm not particularly in favor of police defunding. I am in favor of of investigating and and trying to control violent individuals within the police forces. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I just noticed recently that New York City has uh, has recently increased encountered yeah. to cutting back. They have recently increased the amount of police on the streets, and and uh, so we remains to be seen whether whether some of these uh, social programs are more effective right. than police uh, <coughs> or not. I, uh, Brian, your yeah. study you say that's that's very very encouraging if you can keep that up because again. <laughs> What's the question? Is the twig is bent so the tree inclines? Get that twig and bend it the right way. Uh, very important to do. So, what, what so are you far it's, it's 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 homicides. It's not overall crime rate. Uh, you got to look out for for media hype. That some of the uh, the nonprofits that, that look into some of these other social programs are are pretty concerned that the media is just pointing out the uh, quote increases in crime rate without really specifying. And and this is drawing attention away from their efforts. And uh, I don't know what what uh, solutions are here. And so far, I don't think anybody knows what solutions are here. And it doesn't mean it's not a serious problem because I think it is. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to discuss some of this. It, it seems to me like we're in the middle of a perfect storm. Uh, we've had a, you know, we have a pandemic uh, that has caused a big interruption in social services, schools have closed down and uh, after activities and and all of that, and uh, uh, young people who commit an awful lot of crimes uh, se seem to be uh, on their uh, on their own. Uh, in addition to that, the George Floyd uh, case uh, has resulted in us almost canonizing a career criminal. Uh, we've done that with uh, with other uh, career criminals who have. Uh, uh, be, become the focal point of adulation. Uh, and that uh, when that happens, it seems to me that there's an awful lot of wannabes out there. They want to be a George Floyd and uh, go down in history as a, uh, as a great hero. Uh, and, you know, and at the same time, we've got this, uh, the social programs that are being interrupted. It just seems like an awful lot happening at one time. Patty, you look like you have an well, idea about that. You mentioned canonization of of George Floyd as you are. I it sounded like you were saying that he was a career criminal, and he was. And, but he was not in jail at the time. Was not. He was not charged no. with anything. He was not doing anything. Nor did he do anything for which he should have been shot. So. I don't know that it's a canonization is the fact that um, we do need to look at the fact that there are police that overreact and that this has caused tension and problems within within all communities. Um, I, you know, I think. What, what I'm thinking about, what I'm thinking I, about, Patty, is that they've made uh, paintings of uh, George Floyd with a halo and a glow. And, and I can see this inspiring other young uh, uh, blacks, especially, to thinking about uh, maybe I can be seen. Well, as to a be George seen Floyd. as a George Floyd, they would have to be killed, and so I don't think that there are many that what? are out there saying, "Gee, I hope the police kill me so that I can be canonized." No. I I understand your point, but um, Elizabeth, we need to wrap up. Oh, I'm very sorry. I forgot to look at my clock. Thank you very much, folks. Good program. <laughs>